Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and then you will have a treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and then said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. All right, so I have three main points today. All right, I'm gonna, no surprises here. This is what we're gonna talk about. We're first gonna talk about why we follow Jesus, all right? The next thing we're gonna talk about is why following Jesus is impossible. All right, there's a verse right there. Jesus said it's impossible to enter the kingdom of God. It's impossible to follow Jesus. And the last point is we need Jesus to do the impossible in our lives to follow. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pray, um, and then we'll go ahead and get right into it. So, Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for this moment. Thank you for this time. God, we ask that this would be your time, that this wouldn't be our time to think about all these different other things that maybe we've been worrying about or other things that we're excited about, Lord, but that this would be a time for our minds to be empty, to be filled with your word. And God, we, we just declare right now that, Lord, we need you. God, we need you to speak. We need you to move, God. This is, this is your children. Uh, this is your time. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay, so right there in the passage, there's a rich young ruler. All right, so he's a guy who has some status. He has some power. He has some authority. He's a ruler, and he's rich, so he has a lot of possessions, and he's young. All right? Myself included, we're all kind of young in here, so this might uh, appeal to us in some sort of way. But anyway, so he's going up to Jesus, and the first thing he does is he says, good teacher. All right? So let's start there. Good teacher. What does he mean by good teacher? Well, if you think about good teachers in our day, you might just think about people that have, you know, good things to say. All right. So someone might come to your mind as like Confucius or like Justin Peters, uh, you know, wise people from old like Aristotle or Plato or maybe some more modern people like Mr. Beast or, you know, those TikTok girls that have like the girl math. Any TikTok girl math girls in here? No. All right. Don't listen to them. They will make you poor. All right. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I mean, all right? But we have all these people that we, we acknowledge that they have something good to say, and so we'll listen to them. We'll listen to what they say, and we might be like, oh man, if you have something good to say, I want to hear from you. I want to hear what knowledge or wisdom you have, all right? So when I was in high school, all right, this is like a real like school teacher, but like really this applies to anybody who has something to say. But when I was in high school, I was in a class called Directed Studies. All right, I know you guys don't know what that means because they had like they kept changing the name. It was like study hall, then it was like focus time, then it was like quiet, do your homework time, and then they'd settle on directed studies. They're like, this is a good word to describe what we want the students to do. We want them to direct this time to their studies. <laughs> Guess how many people directed their time to their studies in that class? Zero. Zero! Because you know, like, why do your homework now when you can just do it later? And plus all your friends are out so you can talk and stuff. And if your teacher's cool, they'll let you talk during directed studies time. If they're not that cool, they'll be like, zip it, y'all. I need to do my work and I can't work when y'all are talking. So I don't want to do nothing. And those two teachers are like kind of scared of, so you, you do be quiet. But that doesn't mean you do your work. It just means you're on your phone, you know. But anyway, and so I was in directed studies. And this is like six months into the school year. I was just bored. And so I just asked my teacher, I was like, hey, Dr. Woodcomb, he's a doctor, he has a PhD, pretty cool. It's like, Dr. Woodcomb, like, why are you a teacher? And he starts telling me that, you know, when he was younger, this is woodworking class, by the way. Uh, does anyone's school still have woodworking class? <laughs> All right, I can't actually see your hands. I don't know why I asked. But anyway, so like, this is woodworking class. Like, I'm in directed study, so I'm not taking the class, but that's what he teaches. And he was like, yeah, I did woodworking when I was younger. Um, and then, you know, from there, I started flipping houses using some of my, my handyman skills. And he started telling me about like all this money he was making from his real estate. And you know, like me, little high school, Evan was like, Bro, like, 
money in real estate. Like you don't do anything. Like you just sit here, you just get like cash into your bank account. Like that sounds awesome, dude. Like how do you do it? Tell me how you do this. And so he starts talking to me like kind of like the game plan overarching. He's not giving me like step by step. He's like, well, first you gotta find a house and fix up. And I'm like, whoa, okay, yeah. But then he's like explaining it. And he's lifting up his hands. And I notice that one of his fingers is just gone. Like he has all five like, you know, like knuckles, but then his ring finger is just like, it's just gone. And I said what you probably shouldn't say to somebody who's like missing a finger. I was like, dude, what happened to your hands? And he, you know, wasn't taken aback by it because he's a teacher, like he had students that all the time. And I was like, dude, what happened to your hand? He goes, oh, I cut it off. I was like, what? You, you cut it off? Like, dude, are you okay? Like what happened? And he starts to explain to me that he was just, you know, doing his mind his own business, doing his woodworking, he was sawing stuff off, and then one time he was just, just, just cut right off, cut his finger clean off. And I was like, so like no one else did this to you? Like you weren't holding a board and someone hit your hand, like you cut your own finger off? He's like, yeah, comes with the job. I was like, no it doesn't. I was like, isn't there like safety regulations you're supposed to follow? Like you shouldn't like cut up, like I didn't say that to me as my teacher, but you know, but I was thinking about like, you shouldn't be cutting off your hand, like that's not good. And anyway, but the point of that story is that he was a good like teacher, like he had good things to say. He had, he really did have real estate. He also had like grandkids and stuff. And I don't really want grandkids right now, but I was thinking, you know, like maybe one day I do want grandkids. I should listen to this man. But like, so he had some good things to say but he also wasn't perfect. And if I would have followed exactly his instructions and if he would have given me more instructions, like I probably also would have never learned about the proper safety regulations and I might also be up here missing a finger if I really you know, took his advice to heart. But the point is, is like, there's people in this world that do have good things to say. That's true. But no one is a perfect good teacher. No one is someone who every single thing, thing they say is gonna be completely true. No one in this world can you trust completely that they will lead you down good paths. There's no one in this world that can fully, selflessly love you for exactly who you are and who you're designed to be. There's no one that's going to be with you every step of the way. There's no one that can promise you that they'll never leave you. There's no one in this world like that. But Jesus is like that. And Jesus was once on this earth. And he died and he rose again. He's still living. And he loves you. And he's all those things I just said. He can, he can, you can trust him completely. He loves you fully. He knows you completely. And he wants a relationship with you. And he is a good and perfect, but he's more than just a teacher. He's a good and perfect Lord. And that's what we see right here in the scripture. If you read it with me, again, um, when he comes and he asks a good teacher, Jesus responds by saying this, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Right? So he does really two things when he says that. The first thing he says is, don't associate me with the rest of the good teachers of the world. Don't associate me with the dude who's like risen up the ladies, and you're like, oh, bro, show me your ways. Like, how do you go up to, like, I maybe could go up to one girl, but you went up to, like, the group of girls, dude. Like, that's, that takes courage. Like, how do you do it? Like, Jesus like, don't associate me with those people. Don't associate me with the, with the governors, with the rulers. As a youth pastor, we go to like youth ministry conferences and like we go and we like listen to other youth pastors that like have successful ministries. Jesus like, don't associate me with anybody who you would consider is a good teacher because I'm more than a good teacher. I am Lord. I'm in charge. I have authority. A teacher, they can give you talents, they can give you skills, they can give you knowledge. But they don't have authority over you. They don't really know what your destiny is supposed to be. They don't, they don't love you, but Jesus being Lord is all those things. He does have authority over your life. Whether you give it to him or not, he has authority over your life. He loves you completely. So Jesus is telling this man, like, look, you did come to me, like, that's a good thing. Well, Jesus didn't say that, but like, we can, we can figure that out. Like, that's a good thing. You did go to the right person, Rich Humberley. You went to the right person, you went to Jesus. But you missed out on realizing that he's more than just a good teacher. He is the good Lord. And look at Jesus. Jesus didn't like shame him for it. He was just like, hey, look, man. Like, this is who I am. Don't come to me saying that's someone I'm not. So Jesus corrects him. That's a beautiful thing. All right. So it's good to follow the right teacher. All right. But now as we kind of continue on with, uh, with the story here, uh, the rich young ruler is like telling Jesus, he's like, man, Jesus, 
Like, this is what I've been doing. I've been doing all these good commandments. I've been trying to follow you. I've been trying to follow God. I've been doing this, this, and this. I've kept them all. And Jesus is like, kind of, you know, I'm like unraveling them with him. And then it gets to the point where he's like, what do I need to do? What do I still lack? And Jesus tells him, well, this is the thing you still lack. You need to go sell all your possessions and come follow me. And there's this moment that we all hit in our lives. Whenever maybe we have started following God, or maybe you never start following God, but we all hit this moment in our lives whenever we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to do life right. We're trying to be honest. We're trying to be, have integrity. We're trying to be intentional. We're trying to be nice. And we hit this point where we've done all the things that we can do. And the next thing that we need to do, we realize, oh man, I can't do that. Like if I try to do that, I feel like I will lose myself or I feel like that's just too much to ask. Like that's too hard of a thing to go after. And we end up realizing that when we try to follow Jesus or we try to do this right, really, like we can't do it. It's impossible. Right. And growing up in the church, I grew up in church um, and also just like being part of college and stuff like this. Like I feel like I have slowly become an expert in following Jesus without Jesus. Like, do you know what I mean when I say like following Jesus without Jesus? Like, oh, I know how to show up on church on Sunday, but like not follow Jesus the rest of the week. Like, I know how to say I'm saved, but not actually give Jesus my life. Like, I know how to say the right things to the right people, but not actually be devoted to him. Like, I know how to follow Jesus without Jesus. Like, I feel like I'm become an expert on that. And Jesus, like, this is, a, this is the rich young ruler right here. He's trying to follow Jesus without Jesus. He's trying to do all the commands, but he's not giving Jesus his life. And when Jesus asks him for all the things, he's like, man, I can't do that. He goes away sad. So we're just going to camp out here for a little bit. What does it really look like to follow Jesus without Jesus? What does it look like to try to do that? Because the reality is following Jesus is impossible with man. Following Jesus by ourselves is impossible. It's right there in the other verse, um, kind of near the bottom. We'll kind of pull up and read it one more time right now. But it says, I think it's verse 26 or 27. It says, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So following Jesus by yourself, it's impossible, but we try to do it anyway. So here are some ways that I've noticed that we try to follow Jesus without Jesus, all right? The first one is when we like treat Jesus like an insurance policy or something, all right? Some of you guys know where I'm going with this. Like it's the fire protection. It's okay, I'm gonna walk through life. I'm gonna have that moment where uh, someone's going to tell me, hey, you need Jesus? And I'm like, okay, I guess I need Jesus. And maybe you had more of a real moment. Maybe it wasn't real. And you just, you just gave your life to Jesus in that moment. But then from that moment on, you kind of took like this Jesus card and you put it in your pocket. And you were like, all right, I'm going to pull this out when I need it now. All right, so I, when I need it, it's going to be like, oh, son, judgment day. You know, whenever I die, I don't need to go to heaven and be like, all right, well, Jesus saved me. You know, got my card, got my Jesus card. Or maybe, like, someone else is trying to evangelize to you, and you're like, man, I don't want to hear this right now. I don't, I don't appreciate it. I, yeah, wait. See, look, I'm a, I, I follow Jesus. We know each other. We homies. Or, like, whenever you're trying to, like, kind of grow into a new group of people, and you're like, you don't know anybody, but you find out one person's a Christian, you're like, oh, we Christians. Like, we know each other and stuff like that. And so, like, we treat Jesus like this insurance policy. But then my question for that is, like, where is Jesus? So I see him in the, in the first moment, and I see him any time the card pulled out, but where is he in all the in-between moments? Like, where is he? He is the author, the giver of life. Every good thing flows from him. That's what his word said. Every good thing flows from him. Why are we not seeking him more? Why are we not seeking the author of everything good more? All right? And then the next one that I, I kind of see is, like, when we have family traditions. You know, like, so, so like, Maybe, I don't know what home life you grew up in and stuff like that, but like some of my cousins, they grew up in families where it was like, all right, we follow Jesus. Yeah, we, we go to church on Easter. Uh, we, go to, we go to church on Christmas. And then on Mother's Day, if mom wants to go to church, we go to church on Mother's Day. Oh, and, and Thanksgiving, we pray. We pray on Thanksgiving. It's like, yeah, we follow Jesus. Like, we're the real deal, you know? And like, that's good. Like, that's a good thing. So to acknowledge Jesus on holidays and to seek after him on those days, but the thing is, you're missing out if all you do is seek Jesus on a holiday. Because Jesus paid for on the cross to have a relationship with you that was daily. He wants to help you through your hard moments. He wants to be with you through the good moments. He wants to counsel you, minister to you, help you make decisions. And it's hard to, to make decisions with Jesus if you're only talking to him on Easter and Christmas. 
Like he has more for you. He paid for more than this. Let's seek him more than this. Or another thing that I see, you know, when we try to follow Jesus without Jesus is like, we, uh, you know, we, we, we say we want Jesus, and maybe we really do want Jesus, but then like, we get distracted, and we just like fill our lives up with all these other things, we don't have any room for Jesus anymore. All right, so like, for example, like, you know, I'm gonna follow Jesus, I'm gonna follow Jesus, but then, you know, like, I get home, and I'm like, oh, it's been a long day, and I see my Bible on the counter, I see the video game controller, and it's like, man, it's been a long day, I need a wine, so, like, I'm just gonna play video games today, and then, like, later I'll get to Jesus, I'll get to Jesus later, oh, you know, like, oh, I know church is tomorrow morning, it's Saturday night, I should go to sleep, but no, I just wanna keep dealing with the bros, or I'm out with friends, and, like, like you just kind of keep pursuing the things of the world, or oh, I got soccer, I got volleyball, I got all the sports, and, like, I just don't have time for Jesus, and you're like, I'm gonna make time here, I'm gonna make time here, but then all of a sudden you realize that, like, most of the time, when you have a decision to make whether you can spend time with God or not, it used to be you would do it like half and half, and all of a sudden it like became like one time Jesus, the so three three fourths of the time it shows like worldly things, and before you know it, you're like, man, I don't have Jesus in my life anymore. Like I know I'm still saved because that's something that God does, but as far as like His involvement in my life, like I miss Him. I feel far from Him. Like I haven't really made time for Him, and that's the way that we try to follow Him without Him. I mean, following Jesus without Jesus is really just a life where we live, and he's not really present in our lives. All right, I want to take a moment just to say, like, this is it. This is, I'm not talking about whether you're saved or not. Salvation is an act of God. When you get saved, it's a done deal. Jesus saves you. All right, he makes you uh, one of his children. He brings you into a relationship with him. But then after that, there's this moment where we get to have a life with him, a life saturated with him. Where he leads us, where he guides us, where he counsels us, where he shows us good things, where, where we give up more of our lives and let him grow further in. And to do that, it takes intentionality. It takes spending time with him. It takes making him a priority. All right, another, another way I see people follow Jesus without Jesus is they kind of simplify his, 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 like the Bible into like a bunch of rules. All right? So like, uh, like, there's, a, like, there's like a lot of commands in the Bible. All right? One time, when I was in high school, I thought it would be a great idea if I just, like, what if I just wrote down all the commands, and I just try to do them all, and then, like, boom, like, that's, I'm following Jesus, like, that's, like, that seemed like a good option to me, and so, uh, this is kind of what I found, this is kind of how my life turned out, by the way, just so we're all on the same page, like, I'm talking about myself, it was part of my testimony, all right, so, you know, I'm in high school, I was like, all right, so this is what it means to follow Jesus, all right, it means that he comes first, right, so he comes first for my friends, for my family, all this stuff, all right, so Jesus is coming first, so I'm always going to show up to church, I'm going to show up to church every single Sunday, and when the church doors open, I'm going to show up, all right, it looks like the children may not be dead here, right, so I'm going to open the door for people, I'm going to do that, I'm going to be kind to people, oh, it says do not complain or argue, right, so again, okay, not going to complain anymore, not going to argue, no gossip, gossip, nada, forgiveness, forgive everyone, got it, and then like, they just like, they just start piling on. And at first, you're like, man, this is a lot. But you're like, I got this. I can do this. And so you go out in the world, and all of a sudden, you're like trying to do this stuff. You're like being kind of people. It starts working out until someone kind of calls you. Like, you're like, you know, maybe you're trying to be really nice, but then they just call you mean. You're like, I don't know why you're calling me mean. I want to be light, but okay, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to move on. This person's spitballs in the class, out my head. I hate this person. I don't hate this person. No, I hate this person. No, I don't hate this person. So don't be angry. Don't be angry. Not going to be angry. All right, we're good. We're good. Teacher, come on. I don't have time to do a whole packet this weekend. Like, I don't want to do that. Oh, no complaining. Not going to complain about it. Just going to do it. Just going to do it. Get home. Mom and dad, clean your room. Mom, I cleaned my room last week. Like, it's still clean. I want you to vacuum. Mom, I don't want to vacuum. No complaining. On your father and mother. Okay, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. Friend gossiping about me. Why are you gossiping about me? We're friends. We're bros, dude. Why do you talk about me behind my back? And then all of a sudden, after that, there's a pornography, there's temptation for pornography. Like, God, I can't do this. I'm getting angry. I don't understand what's happening. I'm trying to follow you, God. Why are you not helping me? And we try to do that. We try to make his book into a list of commands to do on our own. And when it doesn't work, we get confused. And part of my testimony is that my sophomore year of high school, I hit to a spot where I was about to abandon my faith. I was like, God, this doesn't work. God, you don't work. God, you're not showing up for me. Like, I'm getting depressed. I am depressed. God, like, this, this doesn't work for me. And I remember I was going to church camp, and I got real proud. I was like, God, like, if something doesn't change in my relationship with you, like, I just don't, I just don't know what that means, you know? And I got to camp, and God did something miraculous in my life. Um, I just remember I was, it was a moment, I won't go into the whole story, but essentially I had a moment where I felt the Lord 
show me that not, not that everything in my life that I was trying to do, he wasn't saying, he wasn't condemning me, he wasn't saying, no, you're a terrible person, but instead he came to me and said, I see you. I see you where you're at. I love you. And all of a sudden I had a sense that my life, my life was composed of a lot of things that I had a hard time with dealing with, that were hard to walk through, hard to go through. I felt like he was showing me that he was going to use them for a purpose. That they weren't meaningless, that they weren't in vain. And there was a purpose over my life, and there, there was a direction for my life, and that, that, that he, was, he was up to something that I couldn't see. And I, and I was still depressed after that moment, but I had a sense of hope that has never left me since. And later on in college, I could tell you dozens of stories about the miraculous, miracle-working God who does the impossible and how he's reached into my life, and he's healed me of several things. He's given me hope about several things. And I'll tell you that following him has been my most treasured thing in my life. I moved here to Myrtle Beach. I didn't know anybody, but I felt the Lord's call here. And I knew that Jesus would provide for me the way he's provided for me before, and he has. And he has done a miraculous work in my life, and I am so grateful for him. The reality is this. We need that impossible work of God. We don't need something that we can do on our own. If we can do it on our own, then it's not God. We need God to do something that only he can do. Because he is the miracle-working God. And the rich young ruler in this text, as he's following after Jesus, he does some things wrong. All right, so he went to the right person, but he's doing things wrong. And I, and I wrote it down. But this is, what, this is, this is kind of Evan's perspective of what the rich young ruler was doing wrong. All right, it says, I said this. The rich young ruler followed Jesus like a textbook instead of a person. He viewed salvation as a transaction instead of a gift. He saw following Jesus as giving up good things to get on God's good side, rather than giving up the rotten things to make room to receive what's good and clean. He knew God was worthy because of his authoritative position, but he did not see God as worthy of his affection. He did try to abstain from the sin that he clearly did love, but he did not see the greater kingdom of God that was worth his love and pursuit that was greater than himself. You see, when we need to follow Jesus, when we need to follow Jesus, the thing that brings us to him is not the idea that, oh, God can, God can make me rich, or God can bring up my status, or God can make my life better than other people's. Like, that's kind of the rich young ruler's heart here. He's like, God, I want eternal life. Jesus, can you give me eternal life? But the reality is, following Jesus is more about a kingdom that's greater than, than your life. It's about a kingdom, it's about a culture. You know, we have this American culture here where we're really individual and over in the other sea, overseas are like more collective and like there's different cultures where there's a culture called the kingdom of God. And it's a culture where there's forgiveness that it doesn't end. Where people are servants to one another, where people uphold other people's lives as greater than themselves. And this is what Jesus offers us. He says, come follow me and I will bring you into this kingdom that is better than any kingdom here on earth. Where it's a kingdom where you have a father who loves you deeply and immensely. He protects you and provides for you while you're here on earth. And he has work for you to do that impacts not just your life, but the lives around you. He gives you a mission that is about freeing captives, breaking bondages, reigning over like the darkness, letting the light shine, about honesty, integrity, values that we know are good and values that we respect. Like that is what God is inviting us into. That's what the rich young ruler is being invited into. Jesus is like, here, this is one thing that you lack. I know that you love your possessions, but your possessions are stopping you from loving me, from loving my kingdom. Give them up. Give up. And the rich young ruler, to me, this is like the saddest moment of all, all right? The rich young ruler decides in that moment, he doesn't want to ask Jesus for help. He doesn't want to give it up. But instead, he's just like, you know what? I don't think that's for me. And he walks away sad. There's other places in scripture where there's people in similar situations as this man. There was a man who, who was begging the Lord to do a deliverance um, in his family's life. And he said, Jesus, I need you to do this. And Jesus said, do you believe? And the man, instead of saying, no, I don't believe. I guess this isn't for me. He walks away. He said, this is what he does. He says, I believe, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. Like, that's a valid prayer you can pray. When you're struggling, you're like, God, I know I need to do this. God, I know I need to give this up. Or, God, I know I need to step out in faith. It's a very valid prayer to pray. God, I know I need to do this, but, I, but I'm having trouble. Will you help me? 
Will you help me do what's right? Will you help me do what I know I need to do? And to step forward and to do it. And so, if following Jesus is impossible on our own, like, what does it actually look like to do it in his power? What does it look like for God to do the impossible in our lives? To enable us to follow after him, to follow after this kingdom that he has for us. All right? So I wrote down, I wrote down two things. All right? The first thing is that we need to trust Jesus for our salvation. All right? So the first impossible work that God does is he deals with our sin. All right? So you and I, we're, we're born into this world not as people. Disney sometimes says, like, Disney has this idea, all right, I kind of grew up with this, like, this was, like, like, close to my heart, this was a hard thing for me to grasp whenever I was, you know, growing as a believer, but, like, Disney will tell us, like, you're good at heart, but sometimes you do some bad things, all right? God's Word says it differently. God's Word says you are evil at heart, and sometimes you do the right thing. Like, you are evil at heart, and you need your heart to be killed and a new heart to be given to you. And so Jesus, what he does, salvation is this. Jesus came down from his glorious heaven because he loves us. He saw us as worth his time, even though we weren't. But he saw us as worth his time. He walked this earth, and he took our broken, evil hearts, and he took them upon himself, and he cared for them, and he died with them, and he buried them in the grave. He went to the grave, taking our sin down there. And then from there, he rose again, conquering death, and rose up in new life, And he gives us his heart. He gives us his spirit. He gives us his righteousness. And he makes us into a new creation. You see, we need to be renewed. We need to be empowered by God. And it's only through that are we actually able to start following God for real. Is whenever we give our lives to him and we accept his spirit. And that's the second thing. To live a godly life, to pursue after God, to follow God, we need his Holy Spirit. I want you to think about this for a second. All right, Mike. Like, the, what's the most powerful, like, thing in the universe? What's the most powerful, influence person in the universe, all right? It's kind of a no-brainer. It's God, all right? It's God. And God indwells you. So God decided that the best way for all this to work, for you to fall out him, is for him to give you the most powerful person in the universe, himself. And he dwells inside you. The Holy Spirit lives inside you. The moment that you say, God, I want to follow you, when he takes that old heart and he gives you a new one, he puts the spirit in you with it. And now you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit equips you to live a life to follow after God. All right? And this is where this is where it gets sweet. This is where it gets beautiful. This is where it gets amazing. Following God becomes amazing when you realize, wait, my life is about following after the glorious, beautiful kingdom of God. And every single step of the way for me to get there, God gives me his Holy Spirit to help me do that? Like, that's amazing. All right, so the scriptures say so much about the Holy Spirit, but the main things are this. The Holy Spirit does this. He counsels you. All right, so think about a counselor. What do you talk to a counselor about? Everything. Like, you talk to a counselor about everything. Right? There's, there's really nothing in your life that if you go to a counselor, like, you're not going to talk about it. You're like, yeah, I've been struggling with this. Yeah, this really made me mad. This made me upset. Uh, I don't really know what to do here. And the counselor, they'll listen to you. And God is like, he's the mighty counselor. Like, he's better than the counselor because he already knows the right answer. And he knows what you need to hear. And so, like, when you just go and talk to God, like, God, I'm struggling with my a hard time with this. Like, God will help you like a counselor. He's listening to you. And he wants to speak to you as well. Sometimes we were really good at, like, okay, I'm going to talk to God when I pray. But prayer is a two-way street. Sometimes we need to talk to God and hear from God. And maybe talk to God a little bit more. And hear from God a little bit more. Have a dialogue with God about, like, God, I know I need to forgive this person. I'm having a hard time. And maybe it's just you going to him and God shows you, like, well, I know you think you need to forgive them because that's the right thing to do. But you need to forgive them because look at how your thought life has been this past week. Like, this has been really weighing on you all week. It stopped you from being able to be a good friend to this person. You've been kind of having a hard time with your studies in this area. And God's like, man, I want you to, I want you to succeed in these areas. Like, forgive this person. It's not only the right thing to do, but it's good for you. And you're like, man, wow, like, you're right. Like, I do need to forgive this person. Like, this is really taking a toll on me. Like, having a relationship with Jesus. Because when we, when we try to follow Jesus by just like, or I'm going to get saved, I'm not going to spend time with him, or, you know, God, I'll come, I'll come to you when I have time, and we don't have the intentionality, and we don't have the time with God, but when we really do miss out on a beautiful, life-changing life with Jesus. All right? And so the moment that you get saved, the moment that you have the Holy Spirit, from there on out, it's like, it's just you and God. 
all right? Like, I'm not God, I can't tell you exactly what you need to do, all right? If we're pastors in this room, like, they are a gift from God. Pastors are given to help shepherd you guys and help you guys know what you're right. But really, like, it's your, it's your walk with God. Like, this is, this is time for you to be like, all right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go read his word. Not because, like, I know I need to, like, you do know you need to, but, like, I'm gonna go read his word because I wanna know what he says. You know, like, I want to go read God's Word so I know I want to go to the church because I want to talk to other people about God. I want to I see what God's up to in their life. Like, I want to see His kingdom come. If I'm going to see His kingdom come, then I want to know, like, what can I be doing right now? How can I be serving? How can I be inviting people? How can I be sharing? Like, God, what does it look like to share the gospel? Like, like would you show me, Lord, like, what does this scripture mean? When you read it, you're like, man, this is, this is crazy. Like, God, you are doing miracles. And I'll leave you with this, all right? If your if your spiritual life, if you following after God doesn't involve something that you cannot do, then you are missing out on what it looks like to have faith. Faith is trusting God to do something that only He can do. All right, we're gonna go ahead and pray. Um, kind of move into our response time here. So everyone, just go ahead and bow your head, close your eyes. It's a time between you and God. Don't be looking around. At each other, all right. And so, uh, any any youth leaders, if y'all just want to kind of go to the sides of the room, kind of be present. If uh, somebody wants to pray or, or talk to you, that, that you would be available. And so, um, essentially, I just want to I want to give anyone in here an opportunity. If you have never taken that moment to say, "Jesus, I want to follow you," and just like the rich young ruler wants to, wanted to follow you, God, like I'm here ready to follow you. And you're having that moment where you're realizing, man, following God is more than just, like, just, just a prayer. It's, it's, a, it's a commitment. It's giving him my life. It's giving him my future. It's giving him all the things I struggle with. It's giving me him my decisions. And, and like, you're ready to do that. Like, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. So right now, if you're that person, if you're in that spot, it's just as simple as saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. Not as a good teacher, but as the Lord. I want to follow you no matter what happens. I want to commit to you in the good times, in the bad times. And you just, just tell them that. And sometimes we think that following Jesus must mean that life will get easier. And I can tell you from my own testimony and also from the testimony of many people, like, that's not the case. Like, I can, you can read the scripture, that's not the case. Following Jesus doesn't make your life easier. But what it does do is it makes it worthwhile. It gives you a life that's really worth living. A life that you're like joyful to live it. You're glad to go through the hardships. You're glad to go through the trials because you know they mean something. It's a life that is far more influential than a life without it. And so maybe you're also in here, maybe you're in here and you're a person, you have committed your life to Christ. You've, you've been following him, but maybe you've been getting distracted. And you know, like I was on the sports team in high school, like sports aren't bad. You know, I was part of other clubs and doing a lot of different things. I had a job and it's not bad to have things in your life but if you don't have time for God, then don't you feel like you're missing out? If you don't have time to be in a community of other believers, if you don't have time to spend with him in his word, if you don't have time to pray, like, don't you feel like you're missing out? Maybe you need to take a moment to be with God and be like, God, how can I have more time for you because you are the most worthwhile thing in my life? And just figure out, like, what does it look like? What does it look like for you to have time for God and to follow after him? All right? And so um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pray to Jesus, and then we'll kind of have we'll have some worship here in the background. Um, you can go to your youth leaders on the side. You can take a moment to pray just between you and God. This is your this is your moment to do whatever you need to do with God. So, Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have offered for us to follow you. God, thank you that you see us and you look at us. And when you look at us, you love us. You see us exactly where we're at. You, see, you know exactly what needs to happen. You know exactly what we need to do. Thank you, God, that you have taken initiative and done the impossible in our lives, Lord. And so, guys, pray, God, that you would be ministering and moving in this, in this moment, Lord, that your spirit would be rich and present. God, that you would be putting away the things of the enemy, anything that Satan is trying to do. God, that you would just move all that away, God, and move through your spirit, in the hearts and lives of every single person here. May no person in here not say yes to whatever it is you're calling them to do. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen.